Hello, I'm Dr. George Simon, welcoming you to another edition of the new Character Matters. Today's episode is all about narcissism, part four. This is where we begin a discussion about the most serious forms of narcissism. As I've mentioned many times before, uh, narcissism is one of the phenomena of our age, and it exists along a spectrum of both type and severity, as do all character disturbances. And today we're going to be beginning a discussion of when narcissism becomes horribly malignant. Uh, the most malignant forms of narcissism have been called at various points in history, psychopathy or sociopathy. We're gonna be talking today, we're gonna to begin a discussion today about uh, how these severe character disturbances form, what they're really all about, uh, and how to keep your eye out for individuals with uh, some of the characteristics that might put them on the spectrum of this kind of character disturbance. Knowledge is power. Most folks come to realize who certain folks are in character after it's too late. We don't want that to happen. So uh, I hope you'll get something out of this discussion. Now, before we really uh, begin exploring these topics in detail, we have to define some terms, especially the terms personality and character, because we use these terms uh, often somewhat incorrectly um, and often in a way that doesn't really capture the essence of what they are. So uh, we're going to start with that uh, so that we lay a groundwork for you understanding the most disturbed kinds of personalities or character. This is a really important discussion for uh, many reasons, but not the least of which is because of the nature of mental health or uh, psychological disturbances of some kind. You see, there are some conditions that are primarily the result of a brain dysfunction born of biochemical imbalance of some kind. Sometimes the uh, roots of these biochemical imbalances are genetic. Sometimes certain stressors can precipitate uh, certain imbalances. And um, in other cases, the predisposition is there uh, biologically and becomes uh, aggravated by stressful or traumatic circumstances. So there are conditions that basically have to do with something going awry in the brain, biochemically. And uh, these conditions have to be treated uh, uh, various ways, not the least of which is biochemically. Th these uh, biochemical abnormalities, when they occur, can cause an otherwise healthy individual to begin to behave erratically. And in such cases, once the person is treated effectively, has their normal biochemical balances restored, uh, they once again start to function normally, healthily, just as they were before the imbalance occurred. Even the healthiest of us can experience these biochemical abnormalities from time to time. And when properly treated, uh, life resumes as normal and we become our normal, healthily functioning self. Now, there are other conditions that we classify as disorders uh, in psychology and psychiatry that don't really have to do so much with a healthy person becoming unhealthy as a result of some unexpected and hopefully temporary biochemical changes in their brain. 
But sometimes the problems that a person has and that cause difficulties in relationships aren't primarily the result of temporary biochemical imbalances. Sometimes the very way a person chooses to define themselves, the way they prefer to think about things, the attitudes and beliefs they hold, the way they like to see the world and the ways in which they prefer to deal with the world. Sometimes the very way a person is, their preferred way of coping, their preferred way of navigating through life is itself a problem. And at one time we were able to more clearly define when such ways of, of coping and ways of relating were rightfully considered a disorder. That isn't true so much anymore. It's harder than ever to properly define a personality or character disorder. Now, before I go too much further, I should define the difference between personality and character. At one time, personality was pretty universally seen as the social mask that a person wears that they unconsciously construct. This was an idea, a concept introduced uh, many years ago by Sigmund Freud and his followers, even actually before that, the word personality actually uh, comes from the uh, Latin persona, meaning mask. And in the ancient theater, uh, when all the actors were of one gender, male, and when all of the actors merely recited lines because the, the art of emotional expression had not been very well developed, the actors recited their lines uh, and used various masks to denote both gender and feeling states. And uh, so the classical theorists, they adopted this term personality to refer to the kind of facade that we put on in social situations that masks our real feelings, our real self, our real thoughts and attitudes. Somebody uh, asks how we look in a particular outfit and we don't want to offend them. So we say something pleasant, but inwardly we feel entirely differently. Or we present an air of confidence when inwardly we're actually anxious and insecure. So many folks still cling to this notion of personality as a mask, unconsciously constructed, uh, that we present to the world. Um, and this definition, this concept has some validity with certain kinds of individuals, individuals whom I describe in my books, all four of them, by the way, uh, as uh, neurotic uh, because they are dealing with a, uh, a lot of unconscious inner conflicts born of a, co a conflict between their super ego or conscience and their uh, inner instincts, their more baser instincts. Um, and um, when you're talking about average kind of neurotic individuals, this conceptualization of personality still has some value. But most of the time these days, we see personality as a style of relating, the person's preferred uh, way of navigating through life, seeing life, seeing the world and dealing with it. And a lot of things contribute to that. 
uh, some biological factors contribute to, to a, the way a person uh, goes through life and deals with life. Uh, their temperament has something to do with it. Uh, their genetics, uh, their predispositions, uh, a lot of biological factors but uh, also uh, how they uh, grew up, how they were raised, what they learned in their early formative years contributes to it too, how they learned to cope uh, as they were growing up. And it's not just nature, it's not just the inner innate tendencies uh, that, uh, make up a person's personality. And that's not just the way they were raised or the, or the things they learned as they were growing or the experiences they had. And it's more than just a combination of both. It's a kind of a dynamic interaction between the way a person is predisposed to respond to certain stressors in their environment and the kinds of experiences they've had that shapes their personality. Now, character is that moral or ethical side of personality. Character is that aspect of personality that reflects a person's commitment to pro-social values, to a life of integrity, to a way of dealing with the world that reflects some kind of personal, internal, uh, moral compass. Now, you can be uh, somewhat disturbed in personality, in other words, maladjusted in personality, and not be impaired in character. There are many even difficult personalities who are not necessarily uh, character impaired. Character has much more to do with the moral aspects of our functioning, with the ethical aspects of our functioning. It's not just the way we deal with the world, it's what motivates us to deal with the world in the way we do, and how much conscience especially we have, and how we allow it to govern our actions. So given the framework that I've set here, there are a few personalities that are best described as the most character impaired. Why? Because the very way they deal with life, the very way they want to define themselves, who they style themselves to be, how they prefer to be, is in itself a problem. They lack integrity. They lack a moral, a solid moral foundation. They lack the traits and qualities, the personal attributes that make most of us decent people, that make most of us able to get along, be productive, help one another, build positive relationships, etc. Now among these uh, disturbed personalities are the antisocial personalities, the sociopaths, and psychopaths. There is a slight difference between those last two terms I'll explain later. Uh, but let's start with the antisocial types. You know, unfortunately, in common parlance, this term antisocial has been misused so much uh, that we've lost its original meaning almost entirely. Um, and that's not the least uh, bit due to the fact that even professionals have misused terms and fairly egregiously. Uh, but, you know, words have to mean things. And uh, I'm kind of a stickler for accurate definitions. So let's talk about the antisocial types. Now we've been talking about various types of narcissism and uh, this is a continuation of the series. 
But it must be said that there are some personalities that are best defined by the aggressive stance that they take uh, with regard to the world and with life in general. Now, these folks I describe in my books, my books in sheep's clothing, character disturbance, the Judas syndrome, and how did we end up here? All four of my books, I describe uh, these individuals as aggressive personalities because of this stance that they uh, take. Um, they're ferociously independent-minded and uh, prone to aggressively uh, try to determine their own destiny. They absolutely abhor the notion of subordination or submission. Sometimes that's born of uh, some uh, treatment as they were being formed, some harsh treatment, some abuse uh, during their formative years. But most of the time, uh, it's simply uh, an innate uh, tendency to be too aggressive. Now, these folks also tend to think a lot of themselves. They also tend to have an ego that's bent out of shape. And so therefore, all the aggressive personalities, including the antisocial personalities, psychopaths and sociopaths, are narcissistic, malignantly narcissistic. And by malignant narcissism, as we talked about before, we're talking about significant empathy deficits, significant ego inflation, and significant barriers to forming a healthy conscience, a lack of respect for any kind of higher power or authority. So while the aggressive personalities that I'm going to be talking about are inherently narcissistic, not all narcissists are aggressive personalities. So first, as I mentioned, is the antisocial type. And the word does not mean what most folks these days imply. It does not mean someone who is socially aloof or has some anxiety about uh, affiliation with others. The word literally means against society or against the social order. These are folks that deliberately and consciously pit themselves against authority, the rules, uh, the way that most of us agree that we should behave. And uh, that's the origin of the word antisocial, and that's what it technically means. Now, in my books, I turn and I, in several of my blog articles, I term these antisocial types unbridled aggressives. By that I mean they kind of go through life as unscrupulous, undisciplined fighters. When it would pay them to moderate their stance, to back off some. They simply don't. Some would say that they can't. Uh, frankly, they can, but choose not to. Now, I mentioned before that several things contribute to a person's personality makeup. Uh, innate and biological factors play a role. So does early learning experience and a dynamic uh, interaction between these things all contribute to a person developing a style of relating. And in the makeup of these individuals uh, who tend to run afoul of the law a lot because of their uh, adverse attitude toward the rules, uh, in, in their background, uh, there's often some biological factors at work. They tend to have a fairly irascible temperament which means that they uh, get irritated quite easily. 
Um, and when they do become irritated, they tend to overreact. So they're very reactive um, and uh, they're prone to want to fight as opposed to flee uh, when they're perturbed. Uh, so uh, these are the pre, these are some of the predisposing uh, innate factors uh, that make these folks the way they are. Uh, some folks describe uh, these types as the inherently uh, or the innately hot-headed uh, types, as opposed to the cold-hearted types that we'll be talking about uh, in just a little bit. Um, and also in their learning experience, uh, early learning experience, as I mentioned, it's possible that they could have experienced or come out of a harsh environment. So they had to basically learn how to fight to survive, but that does not have to be the case. And to assume so is dangerous, especially because these folks are also notorious uh, for playing the victim and will uh, play on your sympathies by complaining about how awful their circumstances were when in fact uh, a fact-checking uh, history check would show uh, that they uh, either exaggerated or misrepresented significant parts of their history. So um, you can't take any of that uh, verbatim. One of the things that all these types that I'm talking about uh, in, on this program uh, do is lie frequently because they have no respect for the truth. Truth represents the ultimate higher power in life. And there are these folks who are predisposed to take issue with any higher power in their life. Uh, they don't want anyone or anything governing them. They want to set all the rules. And so uh, the truth for them is often what they say it is. Uh, it's part of their narcissistic makeup. Um, they, um, if, if they, they say it's true, it is true, uh, according to them. Um, and uh, there's a, a famous clinician who uh, has a, uh, uh, a way of describing this way of thinking uh, when he says, for them, thinking makes it so. So whatever they think is the truth is the truth. Whatever they think is real is real. They don't want to be encumbered by or governed by any objective reality. So they set their own rules. They're at odds with the system, uh, with authority figures, and they, uh, they frequently run afoul of the law. These hot-headed um, anti-social types. Um, now, all these, uh, these aggressive types that I'm going to be talking about over the next few programs in depth, uh, because of their contentiousness and because of their uh, stubborn refusal to subordinate themselves to anyone or anything, they have trouble internalizing and developing a conscience. And we'll talk more about that later in this program. Uh, so tending to be easily upset, tending to fight too much, uh, tending to be uh, prone to battle against uh, any rules or restrictions or any uh, boundaries. Uh, these folks do what they will and they hurt people. Uh, hurting people is not their primary objective of getting what they want uh, and doing whatever they have to do to get it. Uh, is uh, their primary objective. And if they happen to trample upon others and other people's rights in the process, well, that's just uh, part of the game, shall we say, uh, for them. But then we have two other types that I mentioned earlier that are much more seriously character disturbed and have a much more malignant form of narcissism. And we have alternately called these individuals psychopathic and sociopathic. And as I mentioned earlier, professionals have been the most egregious misusers of the term. 
The term psychopath was actually coined by a very early researcher into a certain kind of uh, criminal. Um, and it should be noted that not all psychopaths are criminal. We'll talk more about that in another program. But researching a certain breed of criminal who seem to have absolutely no remorse about things that they did that significantly hurt people. They seem to have no regrets, no remorse, that they seem to have no apparent compunction for doing some of the most horrendous things that they did. And they appeared to this researcher to be severely lacking in conscience. And because at the time, most folks believed that everybody had some degree of conscience, it was just part of every human being's makeup, it was thought. Um, this researcher regarded these individuals, what he called callous, senseless, remorseless use and abuse of others as a kind of what he called moral insanity. And that's where the term psychopath comes from. It literally means disease of the mind, psychopathic. Pathic being the disease, psycho referring to the mind. So early researchers thought these folks who were so apparently lacking in conscience and who so easily and without seeming remorse wantonly used and abused others, preyed upon others. Uh, early researchers thought of these folks as it somehow suffering from some sort of insanity. Would that they would be insane. Uh, perhaps we would actually have better treatments for them. But these individuals are malignantly narcissistic to the extreme. They consider themselves superior to others. They think normal human beings, those human beings that, that are encumbered by conscience uh, are weak and inferior and therefore are just prey for them. I'll repeat that. They see most of us because we are hampered by qualms of conscience. They see us as inherently inferior, weak, and therefore they're just prey. They're rightful prey. And um, because of their socially predatory nature, the fact that they are nature's only, only known intraspecies predators, uh, because of that, and because of their uh, patterns of wanton use and abuse of others, many uh, clinicians and professionals adopted the term sociopath uh, as a uh, label for these types. Now, we've only begun the discussion. We've only begun the discussion. And very soon I'll have an announcement about the first open line uh, live streamed uh, program where you'll be able to call in. But hopefully this program will spur uh, some, uh, hopefully this program will provoke some curiosity and some questions from folks and you can submit them by going to my blog at uh, www.drgeorgesimon.com. That's D-R-G-E-O-R-G-E-S-I-M-O-N.com. And click on the contact uh, Dr. Simon tab and uh, feature on that page and uh, send me your questions to be addressed on the program. Thanks for joining me. And I'll be talking to you again on another edition of the new Character Matters.